Good morning. morning. It's a pleasure to be here. John, thank you for uh, that kind introduction. Uh, We're kind of new here to your church. Uh, My family is here, my wife, Emmy, and our four children. And we're happy to be here. Uh, As John said, I'm a lawyer, which could mean okay things. If I were a courtroom lawyer, then you can say, well, he's not a pastor. Maybe he's a good speaker, but I'm not even a courtroom lawyer. Uh, The last time I was in open court was about uh, 15 years ago. I am a lawyer who who practices from his computer. The court knows me very well. We keep them very busy, but uh, they rule on our briefs. I'm a sinner. I have no business probably preaching the word, but Jesus used sinners. And uh, I would hasten to say that I am a disciple. Amen. And this morning I would like to speak about this notion of the Bible as a, as a treasure, full of precious gems, if we were to stop and examine them. Finding hidden treasure in the gospel. Before we open God's word, let's uh, pray again. Father in heaven, it's an honor for me to be here, although I don't deserve to be. Lord, we seek your presence. We're here on your day because we want to meet you. We've been surrounded by noise this past week, our work, things that attract our attention, many of those things that may not be you focused, but Lord, we're here today. because we want to meet you. Humble us, Father. May the words that are spoken here be your words, not my words. Holy Spirit, we bid you to please come in your name. Amen. Matthew 13, 44 is a one-sentence parable. I'd uh, invite you to turn there if you haven't done so already. Thank you, Gideon, for reading that this morning. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. These are red letters, which tells us this is Jesus talking. And he's using an analogy, obviously. What does it mean? Well, Christ's Object Lessons is a great little book. If you haven't read it before, Um, page 104 the author tells us very directly in the parable the field containing the treasure represents the holy scriptures and the gospel is the treasure but Jesus said the treasure is hidden this morning I'd like to spend a few minutes looking at this verse, and then, if we dare, to prove it. The gospel is a hidden treasure. Jesus said in in Matthew 13, 44, hidden in a field, which must mean that if you're in the field, you're not going to stumble upon it. 
It's not going to be visible easily. In order to find it, if it's hidden, it needs to be dug up. Casually surveying the field isn't going to reveal the treasure. Using the Christ object lessons analogy of, of the gospel being the treasure, it would mean that if you're reading the Bible, a skim isn't going to reveal it. You can't skim it. You can't read through quickly. You need to dig down. You need to study. You need to pray. And the book Steps to Christ gives us another hint of what we need in order to understand. The author there says, we can attain an understanding of God's word only through the illumination of that spirit by which the word was given. We're going to look at the Bible too, not only the works of the spirit of prophecy, Jesus speaking in John 14, verse 26, confirms what steps to Christ just says. Again, red letters, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remember remembrance all things that I have said to you. So shall we test, shall we test this notion that the gospel is a treasure, that there are gems? I'd like this morning, in the few minutes that we have, to look at a little story. It's actually a story within a story, a parenthetical story almost. And if I were to ask you if you've heard of this story, if you've read this story, I'm sure you would all raise your hands. Turn with me in your Bible, please, to Luke chapter 8, verses 43. We're going to be looking through uh, from verse 43 to 48. Luke chapter 8. And again, I think you'll recognize this story. It's actually... As I said, by context, let's just start at 40. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. So by way of setting, Jesus has just returned from something. What has he been returned? What has he returned from? If you look in the chapter before, he was in the Sea of Galilee. There was a big storm. He was sleeping. You know this story. He gets up and he calms the waves and the sea. And he continues to the other side, and there he heals a demon-possessed man. So he and his disciples are back, and there's a crowd, and they're waiting for him. This is an expectant crowd. And if you look at verse 41, we see probably what the main story here is, and this is the, this man Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, he falls at Jesus' feet and he says, Master, my daughter, my 12-year-old daughter is dying. Will you please come? That's not the story that I'd like to look at. That's not the story where I'd like to look for treasure in the gospel. Verse 43. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians, and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately the flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? Let me stop there for a minute and ask, do you think Jesus, who has just calmed the storm, who has who has already healed multitudes of people, the paralytic, the son of the widow of Nain, does he know who touched him? Do you think he may know? Yes, he knows. I think he may know. 
when all denied, verse 45, when all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? Are you tracking what's, what's going on here? Peter, his simple fisherman, is rebuking the Lord. But I would like to submit to you that Jesus knows Peter is going to rebuke him, and Peter, Jesus wants Peter to rebuke him because in that rebuke we're learning something that Christ wants us to know. <coughs> Continuing on. But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Verse 47, Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. What can we discern from this, from this, uh, from this exchange? Jesus is on his way to Jairus' house. He's moving slowly. We know from the rebuke that the people aren't following Jesus from a respectable distance. His, he's not riding in the Pope's Mobile with a bubble of glass around him. His disciples aren't forming a protective circle. He is being bumped and pushed and prodded from every direction. The Bible says they were thronging him. But in this, in this melee, there was one touch. That wasn't a casual bump. It wasn't even a touch on his person. There was no contact. And that leads us to precious gem what I call precious gem number one. Many people touch Jesus on the road to Jairus' house. But only one was healed. Desire of Ages captures uh, this scene, and I, I didn't put it on a... Um, on a slide because it was too much text and my children and my wife reminded me you can't have a lot of text on your slide so I'm going to read it to you page 343 desire of ages in weakness and suffering she came we're talking about this nameless woman she came to the seaside she didn't drive there she wasn't carried there she walked there where he was teaching and tried to press through the crowd, but in vain. Again, she followed him from the house of Levi Matthew. You remember what happened. Jesus called Levi Matthew as a disciple, and he gave him a big feast. So she was there. She had begun to despair. Don't miss this. She had begun to despair when in making his way through the multitude, he came near where she was. 
I, I know this isn't the Bible. This is what I consider spirit of, many of you consider spirit of prophecy. But doesn't that sound like Jesus? She came, she tried the best she could, but when she couldn't get there, he came to her. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that similar to what the father did with the prodigal son? Did he wait for him to come and grovel at his feet? Mm -mm. Luke 15, 20 shows a different story. And when he was yet a great distance, his father saw him, had compassion for him, and ran to him and shushed him. Jesus came to her. Continuing on in this scene and Desire of Ages, the golden opportunity had come. She was in the presence of the great physician. But amid the confusion, she could not speak to him nor catch more than a passing glimpse of his figure. Fearing of losing her one chance of relief, she pressed forward, saying to, to herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. This actually is in the Bible. This story is in three of the Gospels. I think it's in Matthew. If I may but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. As he was passing, she reached forward and succeeded in barely touching the border of his garment. But in that moment, she knew she was healed. And Desire of Ages puts it so poignantly, in that one touch was concentrated the faith of her life. Did that faith come at that moment? I would submit to you that she had heard about Jesus and her faith grew from the stories. And that's why she traveled to him. That faith started long before. And instantly her pain and feebleness gave place to the vigor of perfect health. Many people touch Jesus on the road to Jairus' house, but only one, only one was healed. Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you whole. Applying this lesson to the gospel, the gospel is a treasure that's hidden. The Bible contains the gospel which is hidden. What's the lesson? What's the lesson? A casual relationship for Jesus, with Jesus doesn't get us anything. Desire of Ages says, A nominal faith in Christ, which accepts Him merely as the Savior of the world, can never bring healing in the soul. This woman was healed because she had faith. What can we extrapolate from this? Did the crowd believe Jesus could heal? The Bible says they were expecting him. They were waiting for him. When I read this, I think that, and when I think of how this applies to the Bible and how we view it, We will not be filled, we will not be healed, we will not be blessed 
if we content ourselves with a casual skim, that 10 second morning prayer, the quick stealth prayer at lunch, Please bless it. The yawn stifled prayer as we fall into bed. Matthew 13 58 says of Jesus when he ministered in his hometown of Nazareth that he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Did Jesus want to, did he want to heal in his hometown? You bet he did. But what caused and what prevented them from being healed? Their unbelief. Is that what prevents us from getting a blessing? Are we, are we reading the news before the Bible? Do we have time for even the Bible? Are we spending time looking at our 401ks, chasing after lake houses? Boats, nice cars. Isn't it our unbelief that causes us not to read the Bible? What's so important about the news? Who reads yesterday's news in the day of the newspaper? Did anyone read a day old newspaper? I didn't, I didn't know anyone who did that. If yesterday's news isn't important, why isn't the good news of the Bible something that we look for each day? Could it be that we're not seeing Jesus? We're not meeting Him because we're not spending time seeking Him? Precious gem number two in this five verse vignette. After healing the woman, Jesus desired her to acknowledge the blessing she had received. He could have let her go. Could have let her go. Desire of Ages says, the gifts which the gospel offered are not to be secured by stealth or enjoyed in secret. So the Lord calls upon us for confession of his goodness. Isaiah 43, 12. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Why didn't he let her go? I think that Jesus wanted to heal everyone in that crowd. But there was only one who was ready. So out of love for her, out of love for the crowd, and out of love for us, He called her out. I believe that Jesus wanted everyone who touched him to be healed. Peter, I know who touched me. But I wanted you to rebuke me, Peter. Because in your, your rebuke, you revealed to us, to the church in Damascus, that many people touched me, but only one was healed. Did you see, Did you see that she touched me from behind? Everybody would have missed it if Christ didn't stop. and call her out. 
And the Bible is consistent with this. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 13 says, and you know, all, you all know this verse, it's a beautiful verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all, with all your heart. On my wall in my office, I have two large uh, bulletin boards. And I used to have work-related materials there. Like um, information related to the law that I practice in front of the, the, uh, the um, phone directory of the folks in my firm, the phone directory of the court personnel, the phone directory of the Department of Veterans Affairs. But I have on my wall, I've started now in these last couple years to have what I consider precious verses. And one of those is this one. In the Desire of Ages, page 347, our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. That which is most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. Our confession of his faithfulness. What does that presuppose? That we have a testimony. Do you have a testimony? I read this... Uh, I read this several years ago, and it stopped me in my tracks. Because I had grown up an Adventist, fortunately, and I was just as grumpy in the morning as the next guy until I got my coffee. I was no different. And if you're a Christian, that's a problem. Because you're salt that lost its saltiness. You're a vessel without oil. And what happened to those who had the lamps that had no oil? You know the parable of the virgins. Those who had no oil were excluded. I don't want to be excluded. The first part of the word testimony is test. In order to have a testimony, you need to pass a test. God wants to test us. Speaking about our acknowledgments of God working in our lives, Desire of Ages says, These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of His grace, when supported by a Christ-like life, have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. Our acknowledgments, when supported by our Christ-like life, work for the salvation of souls. You know, I, I study this, and I have to say, I would uh, commend any layperson to prepare a sermon because it forces you to dig like you've never dug before. And I have been so blessed by this study. I didn't have time this week. I had so much work, I didn't think I had time. But the fear of having to stand up here. <laughs> the Bible is a book full of treasure if you spend the time, if you invite the Holy Spirit. If you carefully read it, 
Did you see this? Had you seen this when you read this story before? Had Jesus not stopped and called this woman out, had he not allowed Jesus to, uh, Peter to rebuke him, we would never have, we would never have appreciated, we have never, would never have had this testimony that many people touched Jesus on the way to Jairus' house, but only one was healed. The Bible is a book full of treasure not found by casual reading. Let us be reminded that our Heavenly Father wants to meet us every day. Steps to Christ says that the angels, and I'm, this is a bad paraphrase, it's not part of my notes, it just came to my mind, the angels are surprised how little we pray, how little we reach out. We have it, it's there, but we don't avail ourselves to it. The book of James says, if you lack wisdom, you, all you need to do is ask for wisdom, and he gives it freely. Why aren't we asking for wisdom every day? Do we not believe him? If you look at the other um, records of healing, if you look at Bartimaeus, if you look at Zacchaeus, if you look at the paralytic, these people were intentional about seeing Jesus. They went as if their lives depended on it. And each time, did you ever catch this? Each time he would say, your faith has healed you. I believe that the story of Jacob wrestling with the Lord is a story that was recorded for us. He wants us to wrestle with him. He wants to hear from our lips, I will not let you go until you bless me. I believe that. And I think he wants to bless us. In closing, I would like to talk about one other precious promise in another part of the Bible in the book of Psalms that has been very meaningful to me. It's one of these verses, again, you can read it quickly and miss it. If you don't pay attention, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do you, who's speaking here? Is this David speaking? If it was David, I would suggest that the last, second to the last word wouldn't be capitalized. This is the Lord talking. And what does it mean? How can you be guided with someone's eye? You got to be looking at them. You got to be looking at them. God is telling us that He wants to teach us, He wants to instruct us. We have to be looking at Him. It, this reminds me of Peter when he was called out of the boat. You know that story. All was well when he was looking at Jesus. He fell like a stone when he turned away. 
My prayer this morning is that we would not look at our Bibles, not look at the gospel as an old dusty book that we don't have time for, that we would reach for it before we read the news on our phones, before we update our status from happy to glad. He wants to talk to us. I believe that. And I pray that we will listen, that we will seek Him. Amen.